Today's Bible reading will be taken from um, the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 1 to 16. This can be found in pages 1,175 in your, chap- in your church Bible. Unity and maturity in the body of Christ. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to, make for uni- to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ appointed it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. Why does he ascend mean except he has also descended to a lower earthly regions? He who descended is a very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophet, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers, to equip his people for works of service, so that the body of Christ will be built up until we reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, and blown here and there by every wind of teaching, and the cunning and craftiness of people by their own deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of Christ, who is in the head, that is, Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every support and ligament, grows and builds itself up in in love as each part does its work. This is a word of the Lord. Afternoon, everybody. Uh, It's good to see you all. Um, uh, Big welcome if you're joining us online as well. And if anyone's new and hasn't joined us before, then my name's Stuart and I'm the vicar here. And... um, as you kind of might already know, we are in the run-up to our Commitment Sunday. Uh, if you've been sit- sitting uh, around, you might have seen one of the flyers there. Um, we're going to be talking about it a bit later. But very soon, next week, we'll be coming together for that. And um, in this run-up, we've been sharing lots of vision uh, about where we feel God's calling us to and the things we feel God is calling us to do. If you haven't seen the Commitment Sunday video yet, please do go and watch that. It's both encouraging and informative in equal measure. But I always get a little bit nervous uh, when it comes to this topic of vision. I always get a little bit nervous. when it, It's too easy to just get focused on those things that we feel called to do. Uh, it's too easy to get excited about the kind of big projects and exciting things coming up. And today, before, in the run-up to, to, to that, I, I want to focus somewhere else because I think it is actually often it's just as important who we are than what we do. It's often more important how we do things, the character of our life together as a church, than it is what, what we end up doing together. And so today, I want to talk from one of my favorite passages, which is in Ephesians chapter 4. And it's just a fantastic passage which in which Paul lays out God's vision for his church. And these are the things that are true of a healthy church, no matter what stage of life it's in, no matter what it's called to. And I hope it will encourage and challenge us and help us as we run up to Commitment Sunday. So let's pray together before we dive in. Lord Jesus, we thank you for, um, as we'll see, this, this picture of your people We thank you that you died not only for each one of us, but for your church. Lord, as we enter this season of thinking about our corporate life together and um, what you've called us to as a church, we pray that you'd fill us with your spirit and you'd give us your eyes to see 
what you're calling us to be. Amen. So in this passage, it's rich with things that we could take away. Um, but I guess the thing I want us to, to, to really take home today is the fact that we are called together as one body. And this might seem a really simple thing, but it's a really, really important thing to, for us to kind of register and to focus on. The first thing I want to uh, highlight in our passage you know, it's one of the privileges that we have in the Western world that we often kind of take for granted is that uh, we have such easy access to the Bible in our language. Uh, actually, that wasn't true for much of church history. Um, for many, many hundreds of years, the Bible was just written in Latin, no matter what language you spoke. And there are still parts of the world where actually it's really hard to get hold of the scriptures in our own language. So we are super privileged to have God's word in English, right here for us to read. But one of the small but important uh, challenges of reading the scriptures in English um, is this. In English, the word you and the word you sound very similar. <laughs> By that I mean, actually, in, in the original languages, in, especially Greek, uh, and in many other languages, the, the word you singular and the word you plural actually look different when you read them. And it's easier to tell the difference about when the Bible is talking about one and the other. And that might seem like a very, very small thing, but actually I think sometimes it makes a really big difference to how we view ourselves and how we view the church. And it's, it, it's true here. As we come to the beginning of our passage, we find verse 1, Paul's writing this, As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. And I don't know about you, but I think very often it's, it's easy to just say, oh, oh, thank you, Paul, for that challenge. I wonder, how will I live a life worthy of the calling that I have received? <laughs> but sometimes we could just read it like that. But actually, if we look a little bit deeper, that you, it's not you singular, it's you plural. And that's the first thing I just really want to get across. God's vision for his people is plural. When he calls us, he calls us together. I wonder if there aren't quite a few of us here today where it certainly might have times when we kind of prefer it wasn't that way. <laughs> kind of wish that God hadn't called us along with all of these other odd Christians, <laughs> difficult Christians. Um, I've just been away to the New Wine Leadership Conference. Um, it was incredibly encouraging. But also, um, I met up with a whole bunch of my friends who are in churches and church leaders all over the country. And it's not hard also to hear stories of disappointment and disillusionment and where people have been hurt by church and it's just been really challenging. Um, maybe we here have some of our own stories of that. And I think it's very natural sometimes after a while, you know, to sort of begin to think, well, okay, well, I'm quite keen on this Jesus. But actually, I kind of wish he hadn't called me along with all of these others. It's challenging, isn't it? But I think the first major section of our passage today is really Paul reminding us we can't do this on our own. Actually, uh, you know, th thinking that we, we would love to be a Christian but without the church is a bit like a footballer saying, look, I feel really called to play football, but I'd like to do it all on my own. Thank you very much. Right? You can't really do it. That's just not the way the game of football works. You could do some things that resemble football, you could do, go and do keepy-uppies on your own if you want. You could uh, take some shots at goal, do some fitness, but you can't actually play the game of football. Even, you know, the greats, even, you know, Cristiano Ronaldo, you know, possibly the player of a generation, you know, he, he maybe has an ego, like he'd like to be the only person on the pitch at times. He might at times have been so much more skillful than those around him. He might sometimes have looked like he was the only person on the pitch. But even he could not play a game of football on his own. And that's what Paul's saying to us. Actually, this is how it's been made. We're on a team. We win or lose with our team. However good it is, however bad it is, he has called us together. He says this in so many different ways. He, he emphasizes in these first few verses, like it, there's one faith, one baptism, one father. Verse 4, he says, says it really clearly. Paul says, there is one body bound together by one spirit. That one body is the church. 
And, he, you know, sometimes we can look at these images, we think, oh, that's just a nice metaphor for Paul, isn't that? It's a nice metaphor. But, no, he's talking about something profound that has happened. Um, maybe you were at one of the baptism services last week, either in the 9.30 or in the evening service. We say, we say these words regularly at baptism. God has received you by baptism into his church. We welcome you into the Lord's family. We are members together of the body of Christ. We are children of the same heavenly Father. We are inheritors of the kingdom of God. We welcome you. When you became a Christian, something extraordinary happened. New life broke in. The Holy Spirit of God dwelt in you. But the thing is, uh, the same Spirit that dwells in you dwells in everyone else the Lord has called. And, and, and in that moment, you became inextricably bound up with everyone else that Jesus has called to follow him. We are together one body. God has called us together. And so as we approach Commitment Sunday um, th- th- this year, you know, uh, if you go and look in those, the four things that we're inviting us all to, 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 to consider and commit to next week, the first one we put there is belong. <laughs> belong. Now that might seem a little bit trivial. Some of us here might be like, yeah, thanks. What does that even mean? I come to HT. What, what are you really asking of me? You know? Others of us, it might be the opposite. Maybe you um, are just investigating or you've been kind of sitting on the edge of church. You might actually think, whoa, you know, hold on. I'm happy just kind of coming along here, but you know, why do I have to belong? You know, what's that about? But I think what we're trying to flag here is that when Jesus looks at his church, he doesn't just want us to be a crowd. He doesn't just want us to gather as some sort of audience, but actually he wants us to be a body. And we here at HT, we we need to acknowledge, uh, especially when we come next week to to looking at all that God's doing and the way that we're growing, actually the bigger we get as a church, the more that's going on, the harder it's going to be to, to actually be a body and actually belong to one another. It takes intentionality, it takes effort, it takes working out to choose to be involved in each other's lives, to know each other, and to belong to one another. Um, I was talking to some friends um, a few, uh, a couple of months ago, I guess, and they're really, really stuck in here at HT, but uh, they told me their story of, of kind of their early years here at HT when, when they weren't, actually, and I'll share it because it's, I think it's a helpful it's a helpful story. They said that when they first arrived here a number of years ago, um, first of all, uh, they thought they were only going to be here for a year. Uh, one of them was, was on a course that only lasted a year. And so, you know, they thought, well, okay, we'll come along to HT. We like HT. That's fine. But actually, we're, you know, we're, we're connected to a great church somewhere else. And we've got lots of Christian friends supporting us from around the world. We'll just continue to make that our primary network because we're only here for a year. And then got to the end of the year, and surprise, surprise, it wasn't their only year here. And they ended up getting jobs here, and sort of was like, oh, okay, all right, well, maybe we should put down roots. But then the pandemic hit, and it was suddenly, oh, it was so much harder to get to know people. And there was the option to join an online HT home group or whatever. But they thought, oh, well, we've still got all of these great connections around, and everything's online anyway. And, you know, so they were sort of coming along and being involved, but actually. And then suddenly it just rolled on and rolled on without realizing it. A few years in, before they sort of woke up and thought, hold on, we've been here for years. We come to HT, but we don't feel we belong at HT. And it was like so simple, but for them, they were telling me about this, this this mentality shift where they're like, hold on, no, this is our family. This is the church that God has called us to. And so actually we need to choose to belong. And for them, it was a, a, a series of practical things, coming along to certain things, joining a home group here. But it was also a mentality shift to say, I'm not just going to come, but I'm going to bring myself. I'm going to open up my life. I'm going to, I'm going to give myself to this community and make friends here at HT. And that's what I think Paul is highlighting in this passage. There's this truth. We are spiritually one body. We're bound together. But also it takes, it takes intentionality and effort. In verses 2 and 3, Paul gives us a series of things to do. He says choose to be humble and gentle choose to be patient and to bear with one another in love and then you see just below that he says make every effort to maintain this unity that 
you've been brought into. That's, a, that's an interesting phrase, isn't it? Make every effort. It takes intentionality and effort to reflect this unity in reality. So I wonder, as we come up to Commitment Sunday, maybe you've just been here, I don't know, six months or something. This is a good time for you. But for many of us, we've been here for a long time. It's an opportunity to us to, for us to reflect. What would it look like to choose to belong this coming year? It could be different things. If you're on the edge or you're new, maybe it's a really the most basic step is I'm going to sign up for emails. <laughs> I'm going to start finding out more. I'm going to come to a Discover or something like that. But it might be a different thing. We, we talk a lot here at HT about small groups, joining a small group. Maybe you could join a home group, or if you're a student, you've been coming along, but you've not yet found your way to student night, um, choosing to commit to a small group. Now, I'll let you in on a little bit of secret. Small groups are not magic. They're not magic. I mean, sometimes we can imagine, you can get the impression like, you know, you join a small group and your life as a Christian will be perfect. You will turn up and you will instantly find the deepest, greatest friends of all time. And the Bible studies will be the most in-depth, amazing, the zenith of discipleship ever. And it'll, prayer will be easy and it'll be fantastic and it'll solve all your problems. No, it's, it's not like that at all. And the reason is because you're there. And I'm there, and we're just normal Christians bumping along. And you, but you know, it, 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 actually, what you find is just you know people with problems and opening up passages and going, oh, what does this mean? And how on earth does it apply? And then we pray for each other. And it, 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 but actually, that's the point. That's the point. Is that actually we're getting beyond that? Just kind of coming on a Sunday and into each other's lives. We're, we're meeting each other where we're at, and one person's going through a difficult time, and someone else is supporting them. And then next week, it's the other way around. But we, we're choosing to give ourselves. And another final thing just in this section I want to flag is the power of simple hospitality. Simple hospitality. Sometimes in a large church, it's easy to look around and think, I'm never going to know everybody. How could I possibly know everyone? Well, maybe that's true, but you'd be surprised how far you get if you start just getting to know somebody <laughs> and welcoming somebody. And uh, I just want to put a little challenge out to you. You know, how about if each and every one of us here who considered HT to be their home decided to um, uh, have one person or one couple or one family that we didn't know around for lunch or dinner once a month? Just once a month. Uh, you know, or maybe even uh, even better idea, you, you could plan once a month we're going to have someone we do know, and, you know, maybe someone we like, um, along with someone we don't know yet. I mean, that's great, because you know that even if you know, the, the other person's a car crash, at least you've got one friend with you. That's great. But also, brilliant, they're meeting them, and you could think about who's good to meet. But if we all did that once a month, it wouldn't change the world in one month or even two months. Or th but over time, you discover, wow, we are really beginning to become a family. But it takes time. It takes effort intentionally. I wonder, what would it look like for us to think, okay, the Lord has called us together. How can we belong in this next season? But that brings us to the next thing, because actually belonging on its own isn't the final destination. It isn't, isn't, isn't the whole point of, of church. And that might sound silly, um, but it is actually important to say, you know, just community on its own or inclusion on its own is, is a bit of a shallow uh, vision for what church is about. Because God's vision is deeper than that. It's bigger than that. It's that we would be included in the body of Christ, but then as that happens, we would grow as the body of Christ to look more and more like Jesus. We become part of, of, of the family so that we can grow. Healthy children grow and mature. That's just a fact of life. If, if children don't grow and mature, then there's something, there's something wrong. Um, I see this every day. Uh, my, my oldest, she's Two, two years, three months, about this high. And she's just in that stage where she's beginning to learn to talk. And every day, there is, she has a new phrase. And sometimes they're quite funny. So um, uh, she's taken recently, um, I have no idea where she's got this from, but she's taken recently, when she finishes a task, she dusts her hands together and says, bish, bash, bosh. <laughs> I don't know where she got that from. It's quite funny. Um, 
And then uh, she's got a bit of sass to her. I ask her at the end of the day, how was your day? And she kind of looks up in the end. She says, oh, yeah, pretty good. <laughs> but yesterday, and I, literally yesterday, she came into the... Uh, I, I was in the kitchen. I was getting frustrated with something. I can't remember, but she heard me exclaim in frustration. And she came through the door, a little two-year-old, and she says, you're okay, you're okay. Tell me what happened. <laughs> and I could just hear myself. I was like, that's what I say. And it's so funny because... Because what's happening is she's growing every day. She looks less like a baby and, scarily, more like me. <laughs> she's growing up, you know, and she's taking on our resemblance. Well, Paul says that this is true of, of infants. We know that. But it also should be true of churches, too. You know, we as a church, we're not the finished article. Far from it. Actually, God's vision for his church is that we grow increasingly in maturity and to resemble Christ. You see that picture, in, you can look down in verse 14 and beyond. He, Paul takes that picture of a body. He's just already talked about as a body. And then he, he talks about beginning as an infant and then growing in maturity so that we grow into the fullness of Christ. I think many of us, are, again, we're used to this idea of growing into the image of God, don't we? You know, you know as I follow Jesus, he's making me look more like him. Amazing passage in 2, two Corinthians. As we you know, reflect on God's glory, grow, grow close to him, he's remaking us into the image of God. And we love that. We love that. Oh, how's God remaking me into the image of God? But sometimes we forget that he's not just doing this on the individual level. He's doing this for us corporately as a church. That when God looks at this, he looks at it, he doesn't just see a series of individuals. He wants his whole church to grow and look more like him. Irenaeus, uh, one of the theologians of the first, uh, early church, um, famously said, the glory of God is a human being fully alive. The glory of God is a human being fully alive. I think Paul might have, might have added, he might have said, yes, and the glory of God is is the community of God's people fully alive. The glory of God is the church fully alive. We are the body of Christ. And, 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 and together we're spent, meant to reflect this glory of God. A passage that's really important for us here at HT is the end of Acts chapter 2. You know, Pentecost happens, the Spirit pours out, and then at the end of Acts chapter 2 it describes the first ever church community. And at the end of that, it tells us that people were being added to their number daily. Every single day, someone was becoming a Christian and joining, and joining the church. And it's, it's, it's a great question to ask, well, why was that happening? Well, I'm sure it was because they were telling people about Jesus. I'm sure we're told that was true. But I, I'm actually even more sure that it was because people were looking in on this community and going, I want to be part of that. They were looking at this spirit-filled life, not just individuals that looked like Jesus, but their life together that looked like Jesus, saying, wow, that's amazing. I want in on that. We hear in that passage about some of these things. They, it says that they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. When people looked in from the outside, they saw a group of people seeking truth, seeking to know their God more, seeking to get to know Jesus more. They, they, they were pursuing Jesus. Um, we're told that they, when people looked on the outs, in from, the, from the outside, they saw a community that spent time worshipping and praying together, you know, seeking God together. It's an interesting thing, isn't it, to, to sort of realize that as individuals, we grow in our kind of maturity, knowing how to worship, knowing how to pray. But there's a corporate side to that as well. We actually have to corporately learn to worship together and pray together. And it's a witness um, we've done a, been doing a little bit of a count over the last few months, and um, here's an interesting fact. Did you know that we, we estimate that over a whole year, there are roughly 2,000 people who walk in our back door during a Sunday service, have a look around and see, and then and, and they usually leave, although some of them stay. 2,000 people pop their head in during a service. When they come in during one of our services, do they see a band playing a song, or do they see a church worshipping? Like, wow, because some people's testimony is, I came in and I, I saw people worshiping and I thought, what is going on? Prayer, you know, I want to put it out there. Like many of, we've been, many of us have been thinking about our prayer life, growing in that. That was our sermon series um, from September. I, I think God still wants to teach us how to pray together. 
drawing us together to pray together. When people looked in on the Acts community, they saw people caring for each other. It talks about them sharing belongings, uh, uh, looking after each other in radical ways. You know, uh, Jesus says they will know they are Christians by their love for one another. And, 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 and this, it's not just individuals, it's the space in between that shows Jesus. It says that there were miracles among them. Well, what does that tell me? It tells me that they were praying for each other. You know, if the miracles were happening in that early church, it tells me that they were a community that was expectant for God to move. That, and they were obviously being vulnerable enough to come and share and talk to each other. Please, can you pray for this? I, I need healing here. Can you help here? And, and they were doing that together. When people walk into the church here and they see us having our ministry time off, you know, towards the end of the service, you know, sometimes it's, it's easy to think, well, what would they think? It's going to be a bit weird, isn't it? It is a bit weird. But I hope what they think is, wow, this is the church that actually believes in God. This is the church that believes in a good God, who, who, who acts and moves and answers prayer. And wow, these are people that are willing to put, bring their guard down and come and ask each other for prayer and, and engage. And wow, there's stories of God at work. It's not just our individual lives. It's our corporate life that is meant to be growing to reflect Jesus. And I want to put it out there that you know, we've got lots of exciting possibilities and projects coming up for us as a church. But if everything failed, if the 345 turned out to be the wrong time and it tanked, if our finances collapsed, if, if Nine Market Street, which we're trying to rent, just fell through, and if everything happened, but at the end of next year, we still had grown to look more like Jesus, we still reflected him more in our life together, that would be a win. That would be success. So God is drawing us together, he's calling us together, but he's also growing us together to look more like him. How does this happen? Well, that brings us to our third and final bit of this passage. What Paul says is that although there is only one body, the church, it doesn't mean there's only just one type of Christian. Well, there's one body, but there's actually many members of that body. In the middle of our passage, uh, you can see it, verse, verse, verse 11, um, Paul identifies five key ministries within the church. Um, he identifies the apostles, the prophets, the pastors, the teachers, and the evangelists. And uh, what, what I found interesting is these are all actually aspects of Jesus' own ministry. These are all things that Jesus, he's the arch apostle, prophet, pastor. He's the shepherd. These are all things that Jesus' ministry is. But what's fascinating is that when Jesus apportions his grace, when he pours out his gifts and his grace on his church, he specifically chooses not to pour them all out on one person. Jesus doesn't make super Christians. There's already one of those. It's called Christ. <laughs> he pours out different parts of his ministries on different people, specifically so I would need you and you would need me. You see what that means? That means that actually we cannot fully offer the world the ministry of Jesus without each other. And it's meant to be that way. It's meant to be that way. But there's actually more than that in this passage, because I still think it's easy for us to think, yeah, sure, but he's still talking about key leaders, isn't he? You know? And, and in a large church like HT, we can still fall into thinking, but you know, what he really means is you know, people on staff. You know, those are the people who are really these apostles, prophets, whatever, but not the rest of us. But a few, a few years ago, I spotted something in this passage that's really transformed my way of, of, of seeing leadership um, in the church. So you can look with me. Paul says in verse 11, as we said, that Christ himself gave the apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists. But then verse 12, he says, what's that for? To equip God's people for works of service. It the point of leaders is not to replace normal Christians <laughs> by doing it professionally. The whole point of, of leaders that God gives to his church is because he wants everyone to be raised up into the different things that we're called to do and be part of that. That's a completely different way of thinking. God doesn't look at leaders first and then the church. He looks first at the church and thinks, what, what leaders should I give it to help the whole church grow up into what it's supposed to be? And each of us learn to take our part and grow in that. 
over the last um, year or so, it's been really exciting to see our um, pastoral oversight team and the wider pastoral ministry growing and taking shape. That's something we started up about a year and a half ago. And there's a core team who help kind of direct that. But part of their job is to try and raise up and equip other pastors in our church. And it's been really encouraging, partly because we've heard so many stories of people who've connected with the pastoral team and been really blessed by that and really felt God has met with them through those, those times. But the other reason it's been really encouraging is Lots of people who've been stepping into that pastor role have been saying, I've been so encouraged. I've been so encouraged by seeing God at work. I feel like I'm stepping into some of my gifts. And uh, yeah, it takes commitment and all of these things, but I feel, like, I feel like God is using me. And, you know, there's been other ripple effects from that. Uh, if you were here at our family gathering at the beginning of the year, um, Jenny, Jenny Allen, who's recently joined the team, she um, is an occupational therapist and she she was praying about what God was calling her to and kind of as part of all this she said well can I try and contract my job from five days a week all into into four days a week which is pretty challenging and and then can I offer a day a week and come and do and do visiting and and, and be equipped to be a pastor in the church and we said yes great and then off the back of hearing about that at the, fa- at the family gathering someone else came to us and said well look I can't offer you a day a week but I'm actually a nurse. I'm in, I'm in, I'm in a hospital. Um, could I be equipped to do some visiting and to visit people, whether they're H tiers or not, in hospital? And, and there's just been other things. And I, I just love that because, you know, among us here at HT, there are pastors and apostles and, 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 and evangelists and, and givers and, you know, people who are equipped to give mercy and, uh, I don't know, people who are launching companies and all kinds of things. And... God wants to raise us up to take our part. And the body of Christ will not fully resemble Christ unless we're all stepping into those things that God has made us to step into. So another thing that we invite everyone to reflect on coming up to Commitment Sunday is, how can I serve? And one way to look at that is kind of, you know, okay, well, of course they want volunteers. You know, they've got lots of things to do. You know, please join a team. You know, fine. Okay, but I think more exciting is, 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 is to think about it this way. You know, we're so good at asking, how is the church helping me look more like Jesus? But we should be adding this other question. How has God made me to help the church look more like Jesus? And those are two good questions to ask alongside each other. And that's the question we really we're offering. And sometimes it, it doesn't look like serving more. Sometimes we're already really serving. But it's still a really good time every year at Commitment Sunday to sit down and think, okay, what are you calling me to this year? What, what, what is it that my time or my gifts or sometimes it's about me and my gifts. Sometimes it's just looking at the church around me and saying, okay, where are the needs? I don't know, maybe you're already a home group leader or a student group leader and you're like, Lord, do you want me to do that again? And hopefully the answer is yes. But it's still even choosing to recommit to that. Make that an actual recommitment. Um, you can have a look in the Commitment Sunday uh, flyers. There's loads of teams that you could join. Um, we're currently particularly uh, trying to uh, reboot and reskill our tech and our live stream team. Uh, if you're part of that, thank you. But others, we'd love to train you if you want to join that team. But also, it doesn't have to be one of those official teams either. We've got people who volunteer to help us with our gift aid, do our finances. Uh, We've got photographers who help Julia take pictures at events. We've got some of our artists who come and decorate the church Christmas. Um, It's looking around and asking, how can I use what God has given me? Or how can I grow in what God has given me? Because God has made us together. Uh, Just one little flag as well. Uh, We are looking for some people to go and help Christ the Redeemer Church. They're running, uh, one of our partner churches, they're running a uh, holiday camp for kids, many of whom don't know Jesus, in the summer. And uh, last year, a couple of HTs tiers joined them, and they were really blessed by that. This year, they're looking for a whole team from HT to go and join them. If you'd love to give a few days or a week in the summer, would love to come and speak to me, or one of the team would love to bless. It could be a really good thing, really exciting thing to be part of. So as we, as we come to a close, you know, just want to remind us that it's so easy to get stuck thinking about ourselves. But God has a bigger picture, a bigger vision for us. He has called us together. We win or lose with the team. 
And he's called us so that we can grow to look more like him, that our life together would reflect Jesus, that people wouldn't just see, us, see, see it in, in what we say, but in our life together. And that happens as we commit, recommit, to belonging together and to serving each other. So how might God be calling you to join this year? Let me finish by praying for us. Lord Jesus, we hear that every day someone was joining the early church. And Father, we'd love that to be true here at HT. But we also know that they were, they were really committed to one another and loving and serving each other and pouring themselves out. We pray as we reflect together and as we approach Commitment Sunday, Lord, we ask you to be speaking to each one of us. Pray that you be giving us your eyes for your church and leading us to those places that you, you want to use us. And Father, we dare to pray as we do that, that many people would join us and see you. Amen.